can be used by a lot. Oh, sorry, I pressed the recording button. <laughs> we are now recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As I was saying, through the recording that is now in process, mm -hmm. uh, we, we hope we're building a resource that will be drawn upon by many other people in the future. So it's not just us that are listening. There are many people whose identities we cannot even guess at yeah. who will also be listening. So thank you for being part of it. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Okay, so are there some people to admit, Michael? Will we make a start? Uh, no, that, that's all, yep. All good? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I think we'd all like to pay our respects to the Indigenous people of the various places where we are, to their elders, past and present, and to their emerging leaders. I wonder if we can call on uh, David to say an opening prayer for us. Let us pray, and as we do so, let us remember, remember first the very reason for this conversation, the Indigenous people of Australia. Let us pray for all people of this land that together we may redeem the years of destruction and loss. And together we may find the way forward for all our people. And let us pray for wisdom and inspiration at this time. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. We would like to very, very warmly welcome Dr. Carolyn Tan. So Carolyn uh, has been known to many in the ASCM over the years, um, particularly those in WA, but also other parts of Australia. And we thought it would be good to invite Carolyn tonight to share a bit about herself, her life, her work, her faith journey. Um, and um, uh, to begin with, um, just I'd, I'd like to um, ask Carolyn to just tell us briefly um, a, a bit about your, your work and your, in your day job, Carolyn, and also in the Anglican Church. You bear many national and Perth responsibilities. And then we'll go into more depth about um, each of those matters but if you could just in a few words um, tell us some of the very exciting and responsible positions that you hold. Thanks. Um, well I suppose work-wise uh, I'm currently engaged as in-house legal counsel in the Amagi Malpa Aboriginal Corporation which is the native title representative body for the um, Yamaji, which is the Geraldton, Murchison, Gascoigne region in WA, and for the Pilbara. Um, probably done more work in the Pilbara, and that's the reason for the backdrop here, because that comes from Guruma country. It's a, it's a place called Jungari. Um, uh, so that's so basically, I suppose, running native title claims and, and negotiations uh, in that respect. Um, in the, in the church, I'm currently the chair of the National Public Affairs Commission of the Anglican Church, and I'm also on the standing committee of uh, the National Anglican Church. Um, in Perth, I'm on various committees like the Diocesan Council, the Social Responsibilities Commission, uh, Legislation Committee, and um, until, well, until just this month, I've, uh, I was the convener of the Aboriginal Ministry Policy Group. Um, yeah, so that's work in church in a nutshell. I, I worship at a parish uh, in North Perth, um, which is uh, sort of the middle of the road. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carolyn. So mm -hmm. can, we, can we ask you first a bit more about your work as a native title lawyer? You've mm -hmm. done that work since 2003, I think, and before that you were a partner in a private law firm 
um, uh, of which the former Attorney General, Mr. Jurak, was formerly a partner. That's and, right. And uh, then since 2003, you've, and, and you did some native title whilst you were in that private firm as well. And now you're, you're working for the corporation, as you mentioned. Could you tell us a bit about what it's like to be a native title lawyer working for an Aboriginal run organisation? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I suppose when I st first started doing heritage work before there was the Native Title Act, and that was what got me into, um, into the, uh, I suppose, the scene with, with Aboriginal issues. Um, and then when the Native Title came in, I could actually get paid for some of the work that I did, which was good. Um, however, because in a private law firm, the representative bodies really didn't have the money to employ private lawyers uh, extensively in the area. And, and I discovered that I really loved it. So I basically said, well, you know, why don't you just pay me to go and work? Well, they, they offered me the position to, to work with them instead, um, which I did. Uh, I mean, I've probably concentrated more on the claim work side of things. And as an in-house counsel, I've had more of an overview of the different claims. So I haven't had to, to deal with the day-to-day -day inquiries in many respects, but but uh, I suppose I'll get pulled into troubleshoot or, or I suppose to proof witnesses, et cetera, for hearings and and, trial, um, and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, there's the claim work and there's also the negotiations with governments and mining companies in relation to future acts. And those sometimes go to hearing as well if, uh, if an agreement's not reached. So those two, those two aspects, I've got a couple, some photos which might be, useful. I don't know if Michael, one is you could, there's one thing, a photo called Waimak Regions, which just gives a picture to New South Wales uh, people who don't know Western Australia that well, as to, uh, oh, it's probably the last one. Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry, I haven't got these in order, but it's the last one just shows you where the regions that we work in. Oh, because wonderful. Yes, we can see of, that. Um, yeah, I mean, the Commonwealth Government has basically divided up the whole of Australia into different regions and recognises different bodies for the different regions. So the one that I was in was originally a Yamaji Region Land Council and then it eventually got recognised for the Pilbara as well. So that's where you can see is the, the areas where I, where I work. Um, I'm based in Perth, but uh, because it's such a wide area to cover, it's easier to fly actually from Perth. Um, and uh, and then I've just got some assorted shots. I think if um, Michael wants to show those, they're about uh, not that one. Um, I'll come back to that one later. <laughs> but uh, oh, that, oh that, sorry, that's Chum Creek. Um, there's some. Oh, I, I think thought that just... looked familiar. Yes, yes that's so right. there's, there's, there's some of your um, the, of of um, outback oh, Australia, aren't there? Yes, that's right. And just gives a picture. Um, I've got ones which. Are, uh, Fortescue Riverbed, that's one that shows, I think it's entitled, have you got that, Michael? Uh, um, no, hang on. Sorry. Uh, uh, maybe I can share, let me see. Um, so have you picked up any more, Michael? You haven't got any more, are there? Oh, hang on. Let me see. Um, let me see if I can share. Uh, Sorry, oops. Uh, sorry about this. Um, uh, share screen, here we go. Uh, okay, that's just one sort of in a, is that coming up? Meeting, do you see that? Yeah, okay, that's just in a meeting in, the, in a riverbed. Uh, we're, we're waiting for a meeting to start really, so that's really being out there. Um, this was during a hearing where an, where an olive python was dug out of the, was taken oh. out of the river and actually was actually put around just as during the, during a break. Sorry, I'm, I'm not getting, I'm not oh, getting the pictures. That? No. Ah, can, can any of you see that? I can. I can yeah. see you've got captions underneath and you're identifying the Fortescue Riverbed and the olive python. Oh, okay, so it's not coming up as a... Shit, hang on. Oh. Uh, oh, well, never mind. Sorry. 
You're just seeing the, the whole screen, and you, but not the actual Yeah, not the pictures, no. Not the pictures. Okay, let me see if I can do anything about that. Apologies. Um, okay, hang on. So, anyways, sorry about the technological issues. Um, hmm, I don't know how to sort of do individual ones then, so uh, I'll stop sharing and see if I can. Okay, so Michael, maybe if you see if you can. I don't have those pictures, sorry. Oh, hang on. Sorry, they're not in the Dropbox. That the... No, they uh, weren't. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, I can see them. I... Okay, uh, let me see. Then there's, I've got ones that... Uh, in court, I don't know if you can see one that sort of counsel at a hearing, no? and and that sort of the federal court at a determination. If you can see that one, it's called uh, court NY determination. It just uh... if you press share screen again, Carolyn, they might. Yeah. Like okay. Sorry. I'll try that. Share screen. Uh... Uh, I think what's happening is, is that coming up? Well, now it says you've started screen sharing. Yes, it's coming up. Better. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So that's the one the federal court in a hearing. Um, which is quite interesting that a friend of mine, Elizabeth Smith, once came to one of these hearings and she was a, a liturgist and she was fascinated by the liturgical nature of it all. Oops. So. And she's written some wonderful hymns. <laughs> yes. I, I, so that's the olive python one. I don't know if you saw Ooh. that. You see that? Yes. Uh, and oops, I'll go backwards. Uh, and that's the Fortescue River bed. And oh, that's one of me talking to councils for the council for the respondents <laughs> at the hearing. Oops. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. All right. So that worked. Um, so that's just a picture, anyway, of the the wide variety of. Of things we do. Um, it, most hearings are actually on country, so you spend time on country proofing witnesses and then and then uh, actually the court comes out and, and sits down with them, which is good. And Carolyn, um, what, what successes do you feel that the native title regime has had in Western Australia? What are the uh, upsides and what are the downsides? Yeah, I mean it's one of it seems to be one of those, you know, one step forward, two steps back sometimes. I mean, na native title doesn't actually give that much. It's, uh, it recognises rights, but uh, they, they give way to um, future acts, which is sort of where, where uh, you know, someone might, might want to carry out some mining or, or whatever. So, um, but they do give you the opportunity to get around the table, and that's one yes. of the things that for years... Uh, Aboriginal people just ignored, and 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 particularly in WA, where it's such a mining state, um, that yeah, they they just, they just ran roughshod over everything. Despite heritage legislation, most of these uh, most of the people were actually ignored until uh, at least with native title, they've had the opportunity to get, to get around a table and an opportunity in some of the to do some major negotiations, which have got compensation for the the people which they can then use um for themselves uh but of course it's on the downside is i suppose for the first time there's really been something major to fight about between within a group and and that has caused a lot of division uh, whereas people in the past may not have cared too much about who was in the group or who wasn't um when there's uh when there's big you know, compensation to fight over, then that becomes an issue. So that, that's probably, and, and, it, and it doesn't give as much as people would like, of course, that's the other thing. I mean, there are some areas of exclusive possession, but even having exclusive possession doesn't mean you can always exclude everybody. It says you can exclude people until, um, until there is a, well, a, the government either, either tries to, compulsorily acquire the land or grant titles, tenements, and other developments in relation to that land. But, you know, I think it is uh, it is a step forward, at least, an important step and forward. And what do you find most satisfying about that work, Carolyn? 
Well, I just think, I mean, the, you know, just the, the uh, I suppose the joy when people have got determinations, even when it doesn't give that much in terms of uh, power, it, it's recognition and that's really important for people. So yeah, there's, there's the overwhelming joy at these determinations to be recognized to, as the people who as as the people who own the land in a sense, um, as the yes. white people for country. Um, and as I said, with some of these deals, particularly the Pilbara, there's big money involved. Um, and so there, you know, there've been deals which have pumped in millions into the into the Aboriginal community. So they've been able to do things for the first time that they've never been able to do. I mean, they've set up. You know, they've set up structures, they've invested in businesses and that type of thing. I mean, of course, there's a lot of trial and error, but, you know, when it does work, it's great. Yeah. Any questions anyone would like to ask Carolyn about this part of her life? Yeah. I... Okay, I've got one, and that is, um, uh, so uh, uh, as a native title lawyer, you, you must have a lot of resilience, Carolyn, because it would, must require incredible patience uh, in working through the structures and the le legislation that, as you say, doesn't give enough um, and people's expectations. Um, but it sounds as though you think there are overall some gains for Indigenous people, um, even though it doesn't, doesn't do as much as one would hope. Yes, and, and the difficulty is sometimes we're seen as the messenger who gets who gets shot because we're not bringing good news. Um, yes. So that is that is always one of the difficulties. Uh, so I think uh, yeah, native title lawyers have to be resilient. Um, the other interesting thing is obviously as a lawyer when you have one client, you just sit down, you take instructions from that one client, whereas I'm taking instructions from a community, <laughs> and yeah. with all those different viewpoints. Uh, so there's yes. an, a lot of interesting power plays and politics that we have to watch out for as well. Yeah. That'd be really tough, I think. Quite tough. Yeah, and you never know what's going to come up when you turn up to a meeting. <laughs> no, yeah. And and who might be wanting to shaft who, really? Exactly, yes. Yeah, quite difficult. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and then you mentioned that for uh, quite some time you've also been involved with the Anglican Church in their Aboriginal Ministry Policy Group. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, well, that's something that came, uh, that's in the Perth Diocese, though it's come, yes. it came out of uh, a push also nationally. Um, one of the things in, in Perth is that we haven't got that many Aboriginal Anglicans. So the, the few that we do have sort of uh, are stretched quite a bit. But, but the idea was, I mean, we've done things like we've encouraged uh, parishes to put up plaques acknowledging the traditional owners or most most of our area the Yungar people but of course in the Kalgoorlie area you've got the Wong guys and the others as well um in the, we've I mean I know our parish starts every service uh with an acknowledgement of country um and that happens at all the uh, you know big synod events and things like that too um, we've produced a, a book, a uh, Christmas a book in Nyunga and English, so that's been quite popular. Um, it's the nativity story with, with uh, well, the nativity story um, done in Nyunga with artwork. So you've got, you know, Nyunga, Mary and, and et cetera, and, and shepherds. Shepherds, they have to call them sheep workers because they didn't have a term for that, of course. Uh, so that's been that's been a good project. Um, yeah, so I suppose it's more we have a regular yarning sort of session, just a simple thing that we organize in different uh, places, uh, or different parishes over an afternoon, have some Aboriginal elders and others. And, and it's one chance for ordinary church people to actually sit down and meet and talk to Aboriginal people. So we pick a different topic and go around the diocese, you know, around Perth. And the next one's on Aboriginal heritage, actually. Um, so those are the key things. Uh, yeah, I, suppose. I, I imagine that um, your own relationships with Aboriginal people are something that means that some would be willing to 
move into a yarning session with people they don't know and have a serious conversation. So your own relationships with the people you've come to know might actually help in being a bridge between those uh, congregations and the Indigenous people you're working with. Yes, I think the ones that we that do come along are people who are quite open to talking about these things and they have got church backgrounds, so they they are also particularly keen to to uh, I suppose to meet people and to explain their culture to, to people. Um, as I said, I'm, the unfortunate thing is we haven't got that many <laughs> around that, uh, that that we the, the same ones do get used a lot, but we do try to as we have it in different areas, we try to get elders from that area. So that's uh, that's helpful. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, very encouraging, and and in a sense, it's a bit of a model for what could happen in other places too. Hmm. Yes, I certainly think so. Yeah. So I think David, you had a question. I know Robbie's got his hand up, so maybe we'll pass to David. Uh, yeah, uh, one comment on on what Carolyn's been saying in the last uh, minute or two. Uh, the you, your your dealing with uh, uh, symbols in churches that that uh, acknowledge the indigenous people. Mm. Uh, I uh, ran into strife on this one in one of Sydney's major mm. Anglican churches, St James King Street, when I in a sermon there I pointed out that there are three plaques on the wall referring to white people who died in confrontations with Aboriginal people and not a word about the violence experienced by Aboriginal people. And I said, this beautiful church that we love so much is teaching a false history of Australia. That caused some consternation. In fact, there was a committee that rolled on for two years pondering what what could be done about this. What they did about it eventually, I think was very good. They, they left the old plaques right where they were. That's part of Australian history. It, we, we can't paint it out, it's there. But they said, we will put up something else right in the entrance of the church that where everyone sees it. Uh, a, a large plaque. Uh, commemorating the indigenous people of that part of the land uh, and, and also the convicts that had built the church and the convict architect that had designed it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have preferred that to be two separate plaques, but at least we got an acknowledgement. But that led me to think that there are lots, there are other ways in which our churches uh, uh, misrepresent Australian history. I mean, the, the uh, honor rolls that a lot of churches have and that get celebrated, pointed to at uh, Remembrance Day or Anzac Day. Uh, there's no, there's mention of world wars. There's no mention of the founding civil war and of the people on both sides, black and mm -hmm. white who died in that conflict. Uh, the civil war of Australia's founding gets screened out of consciousness by what's in our churches. So I think there's another battle to be mm. had there, uh, especially in the older churches that, that still have those honor rolls or even have flags at the front of the church. Uh, mm. Yeah, that, that was, sorry, that was, oh, can I make one additional comment? I was intrigued in your pictures that you showed the court in session in all its liturgical regalia. Uh, and that reminded me of something that said to me by the then Anglican primate of Canada, he was flying, he was on his way to some small congregation way up in the Arctic that worshiped in a, in a shed. And he had all his, his liturgical regalia with him, uh, mitre and all the rest. And I said, uh, why are you taking all that? You, you could celebrate perfectly well in a very simple, Alban stole, and he said to me, David, these people more than anyone else need to be reminded that they are part of the church. And I, I saw the same thing, I guess the same sort of logic is in your minds when you put on all your regalia 
for a, a meeting of the court way up in the sticks. Uh, yes. These people more than anyone else need to see the, the seriousness of this court in session. But that's just a passing comment. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. During the trial, we, we're, we're just ordinary, wearing ordinary clothes and we're yeah. sitting in the room a bit. And that's the, to make sure that witnesses are comfortable about things. And, and the rules are also a bit different from a normal court because um, the, the native title, it's customary for people to have their, their relatives sitting next to them and to make them feel comfortable. So, uh, so you know, and sometimes evidence is given in a group. Um, but uh, that's... Yeah, I mean, so there's that level of informality, but when it comes to the determination, yes, I think people want to see the whole regalia because that sort of gives a, a level of gravity and, and you know, I suppose, honour to the whole thing, whole yeah. process. Yeah. Yes. Robbie. You're on mute still, Robbie. Ah, oh, thank you. Look, uh, th uh, thanks very much, Carolyn, for, for joining us. Really uh, appreciate meeting you. And uh, it's, uh, it's so interesting to hear about your work and uh, what you were saying about the, uh, the native title uh, discussions in the uh, Pilbara immediately made me think of the uh, Duke and Gorge uh, mm -hmm. situation. And um, the, uh, the whole, um, you were talking about mining companies riding roughshod over uh, Indigenous people's rights and this sense that uh, Indigenous people were just extremely marginalised and and to some extent remain marginalised. And I, I'd just be uh, really interested if, if there's any sort of, uh, you must have had um, some inside knowledge or some perspectives on, on the Duke and Gorge um, incident where, uh, you know, to have uh, 40,000, 50,000 year old uh, artwork just uh, destroyed um, in, uh, with, with such uh, indifference is, mm. uh, is really quite shocking. You know, that whole sense of the depth of relationship that uh, comes to country and place through that sort of uh, timeless uh, connection and, and to have that just so wantonly uh, disregarded is is such an abuse of, of power, and it, it uh, shows some of the the ongoing racism and uh, and cultural uh, difficulties that we have in Australia. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the thing about the destruction of Jukai Gorge was that it was perfectly legal. Um, what happened was uh, there was uh, under our Aboriginal Heritage Act, which is still in force from 1972, um, the minister is able to grant consent to the destruction of sites. And at the time, um, the Rio got the Section 18 consent, um, the full information about the site was not there, but even, even what they had indicated that the site had evidence of 20-something thousand years of, uh, of you know, occupation. And but nevertheless, the minister granted consent. Um, and then uh, subsequently with excavations, they discovered that it was for, you know, 46,000 years of, of uh, occupation. But, uh, um, but even then, as that even what was before the minister, the consent was given. And that's been, the, that's the trouble with the Aboriginal Heritage Act. Uh, and, and also the, of the Native Title Act, because with the Native Title Act, there is no right of veto. So you just get a period of right to negotiate and people are forced into the position where they know that if they say no, the odds are it's going to go to the, the tribunal, at, which is going to probably grant um, or allow the future act to proceed. And if it, that happens, it happens with, with nothing in exchange. So you, you're in, often in a position where you take what you can get because it's better than, than what's going to happen otherwise. And even under the Act, even if the tribunal says an Act can't proceed, the minister has, still has the right to step in and override that. So that, that's the uphill battle that you're facing with uh, the native title. But, it, I mean, so in that particular case, an agreement was reached, um, but, you know, in the hope that the minister would have said no to, to a Section 18. We, okay. I mean, the, sorry. 
a very tough uh, situation, really, Carolyn, with, with legislation that, uh, at least around Australia, it's starting to be said that the, the Heritage Act needs to be updated and needs to be improved, and yeah. that's one thing that's come out of that uh, ghastly destruction. Mm. Can I ask is there any other question on Carolyn's native title work before we just ask her a bit more about her faith journey generally? I think we could talk about your native title work for a long time, Carolyn, but is there anything else pressing? What about from Michael? I actually did want to move away from native title. Okay. And so, right. so maybe it's timely. Now, my question yeah. is, is really, I was intrigued to know that your parish um, does do an acknowledgement of country. And I was talking to my mum today who explained that the, it's been a, a bit of an issue that they acknowledge the country, but only in the Pew Bulletin. It's only written. It's not verbally expressed. So it, it, it intrigued me to know, uh, and it's probably not a question that you specifically, Carolyn, could answer, but uh, I'm interested to know more broadly, to, to, to what extent are parishes acknowledging country and, and building that into their liturgy? Because I think that is my, my understanding of acknowledgement of country builds from the reconciliation movement. Uh, and it's it, it, it's a recognition that um, this this was seen as a as a positive way to 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 heal the past, to need at least acknowledge country, but but to do that in a in a liturgical session, it just got me thinking: How do we do that? So I'm, I'm intrigued, Carolyn. How did you do that in your parish? <laughs> and I'm interested to know how it's done in other parishes as well. I happen to have a good parish in that respect. But, um, but the pattern has been set. Our Archbishop regularly does it at the beginning of services and, and previous Archbishops have as well. So uh, that pattern has been set in, in any you know, official sort of uh, big diocesan services. And I think, you know, as I understand it, the Archbishop does that wherever she goes at the moment. Um, some parishes do just have the acknowledgement in pure bulletins. I think we wanted it specifically said, so it's actually typed into the standard you know, um, service uh, booklet. Um, and I think that's important because you don't forget it then. Um, and is that right at the beginning, Carolyn? Yes, it's right at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, yeah, fantastic. Um, well, it's something for every parish to think about, I think. That's a great model. Um, can we move then, as Michael has mentioned, um, into a bit more about your faith journey, Michael? Uh, Carolyn, uh, mm. Carolyn, can you tell us, did you grow up in a Christian environment? Uh, and um, what was your faith journey and how did the SCM contribute? Um, yes, I did uh, grow up in a, in a Christian environment, but I was brought up in Singapore and then, you know, and uh, where it's fairly a fundamentalist sort of background, I suppose. And um, and I came from a fairly conservative background into university, uh, where, in fact, the group I was part of what was the Anglican Society at UWA and well, even for a part the uh, Christian Union, but I moved into the Anglican Society. And that's, um, it, was, it was in the late 70s, about 79 was my first year at uni, and that's when we were starting to, discover, I suppose, liberation theology. Um, 79 was an important year in, in two respects. One is it was the date of the Sandinista revolution, and we know the importance of the church in that revolution. Um, but also in Western Australia, it was the um, the Nukumba, um, mm. sort of uh, the damage or the, the determination of the government to mine at Nukumba. And that was the situation where uh, we had you know, church people sort of sitting on the uh, in the roads trying to block the the drilling trucks from going in. So it was all that, that time. So coming from a fairly conservative, and a lot of us were private school kids who'd come through that through that, and we we suddenly discovered all of this. Um, so uh, I think it was Andrew McGowan who went across to an SCM conference in '81 came back and told us about SCM and we all decided, yes, that's what we wanted to do. So, 
so I think, and that really got us into it even more. Um, so there was, uh, so 82, end of 82, Chum, Chum Creek Conference was my first national conference, though we've been running the SCM in Perth for a year. And that got me involved. So I, I suppose the whole liberation theology, the introduction at that stage to feminist theology, and Mandy, I brought this up. Okay. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Mandy, no, this is the, the yeah. booklet that you put together yes. on feminism in the church. That's so, right. <laughs> yeah, I, and so that was the, you know, we, we, we sort of discovered feminist theology and all of that too through the uh, through the SCM and, and then, you know, um, yeah, I think that, so that was a big eye opener for otherwise fairly conservative kids, I think that we were at the time. Um, and that whole, I suppose, you know, the uh, preferential option for the poor, the, and, and that drove me, I suppose, in the work that I chose to do. Um, yes, fascinating. Hmm. Uh, in a sense, it all fits together, Carolyn, in a wonderful way. Yeah, and, and really the first, um, I suppose I started doing some Aboriginal heritage work with, with, a, with one elder who said to me, you're the first person who's been able to actually put... Uh, uh, beliefs pro properly into into a legal document, and I thought, well, maybe the reason why I'm the first one that you come across is because I actually have an understanding of the importance of the sacred. Yes, and, and there's an element of the solidarity of, uh, of you know people who believe in the sacred. Um, yeah, that that we could understand that, and we could, I suppose, I could recognize that um, that from that you know we might be book people and get our, our, uh, our, our, I suppose, our theological beliefs from that, but how God would have spoken to people in the past before there was the, the Bible uh, in this country was through through the land, through these sacred places. Yes. Um, yes. And that probably brings us to your thesis. Could you tell us about your PhD thesis? Yes. I, I, something I, uh, it's one of these things that gets narrower and narrower as it goes, but I, did my thesis on the impact of the public-private dichotomy in the religious freedom and religious her cultural heritage laws uh, in four countries, uh, and the impact of that on, on the un understanding of the concept of indigenous sacred place. Um, I suppose the view, what the conclusion I came to was that in, these are the countries, are Australia, New Zealand, USA, and Canada, Similar in the, in the sense of you know the their legal system and the uh, the background of uh, the indigenous background there, but how the um, religious freedom laws are predicated very much on religion as a private matter, and the cultural heritage laws are predicated very much on cultural heritage as a public matter, and really indigenous sacred places don't seem to fit very well on either system. I mean, the, the classic example, I think, was a case that went to the US Supreme Court, a religious freedom case, uh, where the the, uh, the action was going to completely damage the sacred place and destroy the religion completely. But the court said that that is not a breach of the religious freedom because it wasn't coercing their conscience. Oh. So the, the religion could be destroyed, but it didn't didn't coerce the conscience. So, <laughs> so that was sort of, you know, the, the whole like, the whole, I suppose, it's, well, it just shows how the religious freedom concepts were just not suited. Um, and and similarly with the cultural heritage, it's seen as an external, it's based on what we as a wider society want to keep. Um, and that's how, that's the origin of a lot of our cultural heritage models. And so you have an external decision maker deciding on what is really someone's religion. and. Uh, and use, using objective tests and things like that. <laughs> anyway, that's the gist of what I was working on. I did it just for fun, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Carolyn, you're also um, very involved in the Perth Diocesan Council, the Social Responsibility Council of the Anglican Church in Perth. And also you, you're involved in the Public Affairs Unit of the National Australian Anglican Church. Can you tell us what do you think are some of the important things that they are doing? Um, well, starting on the national level first, I mean, we have been involved um, in the uh, 
First Nations voice issues, uh, constitutional recognition. We've been, and this is where it's been contentious, we've been involved in, I suppose, putting a different Anglican view from what you often hear in Sydney um, uh, about uh, sex discrimination and uh, religious discrimination laws. And that's, of course, topical because we're about to get probably a, a new version of the religious discrimination bill. Um, so, and that was actually one of the pictures I did put up earlier about, uh, which was taken at a, a Senate hearing on, on the sex discrimination um, bill exemptions. And they, they, had, they had myself and they had uh, Archbishop Glenn Davies and Bishop Michael Stead all at the same table, giving different views from the Anglican Church point of view. And that was in 2019. Uh, yes, I think so, early, early yes. 10 years. Yes. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's, that's been quite difficult to manage at a national level, as you can imagine, because there are different viewpoints. But the Public Affairs Commission has, well, we keep saying we're not only speaking for the commission, not for the whole church, etc. And And I think there's, there's obviously a lot of other dioceses who are happy to have our voice there because it does at least try to balance out a bit what uh, is regularly, you know, uh, well, what, what this, the view that's more prevalent in some of those places, uh, in Sydney, for instance, especially. especially. But um, yeah, environmental issues, climate change is obviously a big issue. Uh, that, that, that's at a national level. Um, I think, yeah, those are probably the big ones we've been working on. Other things, you know, the charities, amendments, responsible ending laws. Uh, we made submissions to the COVID-19 Senate inquiry uh, and that type of thing. But we have, I suppose, because we haven't got any staff at a national level, we didn't just do what we can. Um, modern slavery was another one we made submissions on. Um, so it's a hodgepodge of whatever comes up, uh, or, you know, nuclear, um, we're trying to get Australia to support the, uh, the anti-nuclear um, treaty. Um, in Perth, pretty much the same, but there's probably less a variety of views in the Perth situation, That's, so it's a bit easier. <laughs> and so uh, what keeps you hanging in there in, in the National Anglican Church uh, and, and in your faith, Carolyn? What do you find sustaining? What helps you? Um, well, I've, I mean, why I'm passionately involved is still for the same social justice reasons, going back to the whole liberation uh, theology thing, but also, um, well, especially LGBTQI issues at the national level are highly fraught, and I think it's extremely important for, um, for a different Anglican voice to be heard, and that's why, yeah, because really, um, I suppose there, there are there are all these other dioceses that people forget about, um, where which have different viewpoints on that issue. Um, so I think that's where we, it's important for us to actually say, well, hang on, you know, we want um, protection from religious, religious discrimination, but really not so much for us. There are, you know, the Muslims, etc., need it far more than we do. Um, and we don't want exemptions that will allow uh, uh, people us to be doing the discriminating to, um, against uh, people, particularly LGBTQI plus people. Um, so I think that's still what's driving me. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a yeah, glutton for punishment, I suppose, but that's, uh, yeah, I think that it's so important for, to hear the church's voice, to hear the church being alongside uh, people who are on the margins. Yes. And I, got I think we'd you. all say amen to that. Yeah. Uh, any comments or questions from anyone? I'd like to pick up on the liberation theology uh, theme that Carolyn mentioned, which is just uh, so important for uh, the uh, bringing the church back into a better comprehension of the message of Christ. Mm. Like the uh, one of the themes that I find really interesting is the comparison between the Roman Empire and the British Empire, and and so how uh, Jesus was expressing solidarity with those who had been uh, oppressed by the Roman Empire mm -hmm. and uh, it creates a very similar situation uh, to uh, the 
solidarity for the Indigenous uh, today. Yes, it's yes. Yes, here, here. Um, and it sounds as though there is some um, more, um, in a sense, a bit more hope in the Perth situation. You say there are fewer diverse voices in a way that people are more on the same page, at least within the diocese, than perhaps nationally in the Anglican Church. Uh, do you find that there's, is there much going on in the ecumenical movement over there in WA that you find hopeful, Carolyn? Um, I, well, uh, yes and no. I mean, there's, the, I think the ecumenical movement certainly isn't uh, as active as it was, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I know that's probably the case right across Australia, I suspect. Having said that, I mean, the, the, certainly within the social justice sphere, we all work together very well. And there's an ecumenical social justice roundtable where the people who work in the area plan things together and we do share things out. You know, like someone might do, take the running on a refugee issue, someone might take the running on some, you know, something else, poverty or whatever. So, uh, so we do work together quite well in, in that sphere. Um, and, and, and it's also interesting that some of those issues like the refugee issues, et cetera, and, and indigenous issues are getting together people who like from the Pentecostal re, uh, sort of uh, churches and things like that too, who probably wouldn't have been as actively involved in the medical movement uh, as a whole. So I think it's uh, while people don't talk so much about humanism, it's more let's just get down and work together on these topics. Just, Which is great because it, that, that sort of comes from the basic question, how can we be a blessing to our community? What needs to be done? Yeah. <laughs> it's very specific and practical, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's where, where it works best. Instead of concentrating on our differences, we'll work together on what does, does unite us. Yes, indeed. Any other comments? I'm intrigued, Carolyn, to know how you came to know SEM I mean I'm, I'm trying to remember how I came to know SEM I was I had no background no no uh, I, I wasn't from a family that knew about SEM I discovered SEM at Sydney University and it changed my life mm. so I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to know I mean, I, I, I gather in Singapore, you probably wouldn't have been involved in the SEM, so you would have discovered SEM in Perth. Um, how and, and what impact? Um, just actually on that point, of course, you might remember that Singapore did have an SEM. Yes. But, uh, there was a, and there was a big uh, issue with the, the arrest of some of the SEM leaders, et cetera. But that wasn't in my time, that was after. Um, how, well, and there was an SCM in Perth in the 1970s, but it, uh, it sort of died out as SCM did in a lot of places um, after the, the, the issue of the, 70, the time of the 70s. But there were still senior friends around who were still passionate about it. I mean, people like Barry Baker that you probably met at the, at the national level. So um, our history was, I, didn't, I knew nothing about the SCM and we didn't have one at any campus, but uh, it's just people heard about the SCM over East and came back with news of the SCM. And once we heard about it, we thought, yes, that's exactly what we want to be. Um, yeah. so, so that's when we, we decided, we dissolved the Anglican Society and became the SCM. Um, <laughs> We got a handful of people who weren't Anglicans who joined us, but you know, the core of us were still the same group from before. Um, and yeah, that, that's, and then we got involved in national conferences and things like that. Which is fascinating. I mean, that's actually, you dissolved the Anglican Society to become an mm -hmm. SEM because that aligned with what you as a group were seeking. So the Anglican Society wasn't delivering as students what you thought the Christian gospel was about? It, it sort of was, but it was, but it wasn't wide enough. I mean, that was the thing. I think we thought the SCM was a, was actually established nationally, so it was something that we could a bigger movement that we could be part of. So I mean, we so we still, yeah, I mean, that's why we did it. We wanted to be part of the bigger movement. Um, what was it? 
Andrew McGowan had a key role in that, did he not, Carolyn? Yes, he was the one who went over to the first to the conference in 81 and came back with, with information, came back with across the currents and, and all that. Uh, so, yeah. yes, uh, he, he was heavily involved in that. He was also one of the leaders of the, the Anglican Society before. So, and yeah. outstanding. And the, and the rest of us all then got involved. I mean, I think I ended up on our national executive for a year of the SCM and, yeah. and, uh, and we ran conferences in the mid 80s. And, uh, yeah, and photos from that time, I think. Is that yeah, well? I, I've, I've just uh, unfortunately these are not all that good because they're photos of. Oh well, yeah, that's the, of uh, of photos of photos. These are the days of pre-digital, I suppose. So, but I just thought there'd be some familiar faces in that group. That was just uh, taken at the uh, Come yes. Creek Conference, and you probably know I, quite a lot. Of those I do people. do recognise Russell Peterson there. That's yeah. the only person I recognise. Oh, Peter Brock next to him. And, uh, oh, is that Peter Brock? I think and so. Michael, oh. Michael, who's now a United Church minister, Michael Barnes on the left oh, there. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Kathy Bishop. And, Cliff yes, Holden. that's right. Yeah. Um, at Lorna Hallahan in the middle of the second photo. Oh, I can, uh, the second and, Rebecca Bishop. And then down the bottom of the left, uh, Jamie Tom and um, Peter Fraser, I think it was. Yes, okay. Uh, and then, uh, then we've got, uh, uh, that's, is it John Quirrell, um, I think, and, and Peter John Young Quirrell. from yes. Brisbane, and um, uh, someone Burgess, I can't remember. And then the, in the middle, yeah, that gives, and, then, and the other, the Cliff Holden was. And, uh, yes. And that Chris Stevenson and Lorna Hallahan. Yes. Bottom right, um, John Ball. Right, uh, yes. Yeah. And the middle, that's uh, that's three of the uh, Perth people on the middle right. Is it Alan Maddox? Maddox and, Alan um, Maddox on the left there, yes. Yes, and then Andrew McGowan, Paul Seeley, Stuart Fenner, and then up the top uh, right was the, the Perth group. Uh, oh, so wonderful. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, so well, I've got some old faces. <laughs> absolutely. And as Michael said earlier, it really does bring back memories. Very yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that all back to us. Uh, but Catherine, I think in a way, uh, what you said not only brings things back to us, but it also gives us inspiration for moving forwards. Because um, if we think about what do we want the church to be, what is important, how do we, what do we think the gospel is fundamentally, and what does it mean uh, in our time, then we are brought back to these really core questions that are central to what is the gospel what is the good news and how do we make it real in our society so I think um, you know your example of the work that you've done over many many years just uh, reminds us of um, of that and um, keeps us focused on uh, thinking well what do we do now is that Michael have you got your hand up oh no, no that's a, that, I'm that's just a, saying what you're saying is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's true, though, isn't it? it? It's at the heart of it all. And um, it's interesting, Carolyn, that you say what keeps you passionate in a way is that continuing desire to try and make it real um, is what came through to me from what you were saying mm -hmm. uh, in our world. And, and, and that's just uh, wonderful. It's, it's very inspiring. Thank you. Any other comments that anyone has? I found uh, Carolyn's comment about the sense of the sacred uh, as a way of uh, engaging with Indigenous culture to be uh, to be really important, and uh, you know, getting that sense of the distinction between a a religion that comes out of a book and a religion that comes out of a a, a really deeply ancient sense of place and of belonging to place. Um, I, like I, my feeling is that there's a, uh, a sort of alienation between spirit and nature within much Western theology and uh, that that, uh, that reconciliation of spirit and nature is, uh, is just so essential for um, how I think of uh, hope and uh, even 
salvation and uh, atonement. You know, some of these theological ideas make sense within a, an indigenous cultural framework, but they don't make sense within that sort of um, more alienated uh, spirituality that that, that I, I fear has uh, has characterised much Christian uh, history. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think, but it's right through the Hebrew scriptures, of course, it's very strongly place-based and, um, yeah, it's a, it's, and I think it's the whole sort of the, almost the pietistic movement that dis dissociated place and, uh, and, uh, and you know, I suppose the, the privatisation of religion is the issue. And that's something that came up in your PhD uh, as yes, well, exactly. very much so. Mm -hmm. That that sense of place, where uh, whereas a, a church is like a deplaced, uh, 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 well, delocated um, sense of the spirit, whereas uh, indigenous traditions uh, are about how the place is is grounded in in its natural environment. Mm. I don't know if church has to be a deplaced uh, sense, Robbie. I think, no, it I mean, the church is the people. Yeah. But if you think of what is the church, the church is the people. It's not buildings. Well, absolutely, it doesn't have to be. But uh, part of the problem is that that's how it has been. So that's how it has been. And so uh, identifying some of those um, perhaps shortcomings of the theological framework where we can learn lessons from uh, indigenous culture. Yeah. Yeah, and, and certainly we can, you know, we discover in our own faith the whole, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, after all, it's a religion around the incarnation. <laughs> it's about flesh and bodies and, and there's a... Um, yeah, it's about the real people and... And yeah, incarnation. Yes, that's that's and and so that is really about real people and enfleshment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we 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 need to perhaps perhaps um, put that to the fore more than we have sometimes. Yeah, but I guess what we can learn from indigenous cultures is that 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 people stuff, the human stuff, who we are. For Indigenous people, that's so intertwined with place. Yes. Um, which is where the acknowledgement of country, I think, is really a powerful... I, I, I have huge respect for the reconciliation movement to have put forward that. And I'm actually really impressed by the extent that it's been taken up across um, so much of Australian society that we do acknowledge that we are in a place mm -hmm. and this place belongs to people and there's an in interconnection there between people and place and I think that's a really powerful message and I, I'm really intrigued to see if that can be integrated into our liturgies as as part of the church. Yeah, here, here. Yes, uh, I think also environmental theology has picked up quite a bit of that too which is good. Um, yeah, the Fantastic. acknowledgement, the the arising of acknowledgement as a uh, significant part of public events uh, and uh, of church identity has been quite a dramatic change in respect for Indigenous people over the last decade, I would say. And uh, I feel that a big part of that is the uh, recognition of guilt and conscience and um, expropriation that Indigenous people have suffered and uh, and also a sense of respect for Indigenous culture, a, a genuine respect for Indigenous culture and of the extremity of loss that Indigenous people have, have suffered. I guess you would be conscious of that uh, just in, in knowing Indigenous people that you know, Carolyn, and what they live yeah, and also I think uh, to realise the complexity and the depth of Indigenous spiritual or Aboriginal spirituality that uh, um, that it's you know it's got a, its own theology <laughs> that's really fascinating. Mm. Yeah, well, 
may we take this opportunity to wish you all the very best with all that vital work that you're doing. And it inspires us to know that um, you uh, feel that the STM did help your journey in many ways. And um, uh, we hope that your faith remains strong and true and that you're able to continue with all that wonderful work that you're doing. And um, uh, we hope that you will remain uh, the wonderful SCM senior friend that you are. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank we'll you. just close with a short prayer. Uh, Robbie, would you like to say a short prayer? Loving God, we uh, give uh, thanks for the uh, message that uh, Carolyn has brought for her uh, passionate work uh, with native title in Western Australia and uh, for the uh, respect that her work has enabled for uh, the dignity, the heritage, the culture, the identity, the relationships uh, of Indigenous people and how much uh, the broader Australian society can learn from Aboriginal people as we, uh, uh, as, as we see the uh, success and, and also the difficulties of the native title work that Carolyn has done. So in the name of Christ, we, uh, we give thanks for the presence of Christ, the presence of God in Australia uh, since time immemorial. And uh, we uh, simply conclude with, uh, with that statement. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Robbie. Uh, so, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us, for sparing the time. We really, really appreciate it. And um, we hope that we'll be able to remain in touch with you in various ways. But God bless and thank you. And to everybody else who's still there, would you mind, uh, Michael, when we stop recording, uh, just remaining on the line for a little while? Just